Hey, very good. Thank you. Um, so we've already got questions in the uh, the hopper, and uh, people want to know about the rest of the world, not just the U.S. But we we did mention Singapore and Taiwan, and the other day we had a speaker talk about the Netherlands traffic uh, management system that apparently is pretty far along. Uh, Clario had a presentation yesterday on that. Um, so. There are more and more cities that talk about smart cities. Um, I wanted to point out that Bob Bruin, I'm sorry, Bob Bennett, who's a good friend of mine from Kansas City, uh, was taken out by the, by the pandemic, not because he's sick, but because he's uh, taking care of uh, Kansas City, Missouri and Jackson County as they try to suddenly grapple with the goal that the president announced just the other day of having all uh, adults uh, eligible for a vaccine by May 1st, eligible, not, not having a vaccine. So they suddenly had to institute something that he had to be called away for. And Tony has graciously decided to come back and talk as a panelist. Uh, he is the CTO of San Leandro. Uh, and we just heard from Sanjeet. Uh, he's also the, the global head of smart cities for Qualcomm and David's uh, uh, from Carlsbad. He's the chief innovation officer there. I, I think I'm, I'll just jump right in if I can and ask each of you to start out and maybe David, you could be the uh, the first uh, and then we'll send you and we'll, we'll go to Tony on uh, just if you could uh, do this as a quick one minute answer. Give me an example of something that works in smart cities, an actual example. It, it could be your own town. And maybe maybe an example of something that just hasn't worked um, or uh, that, that, you know, is in the process of working, but there have been problems. I guess we'll start with David. Thank you. Sure. Well, I think and, and Tony touched on this. I do think that um, we have seen streetlight projects, particularly around parking and parking management, whether that's streetlights or whether that's LIDAR and video analytics associated with that, that has worked. That has been a case that's been proven out for either parking, for traffic management. In our particular case, it's a centralized traffic management center using video analytics that we're upgrading to be able to have dynamic traffic management systems now moving to having these adaptive AI corridors that are changing the signals based upon exactly the what's happening on the ground as opposed to a human having to intervene there. I do think in the traffic management sector, um, it has worked. There are some that have worked better than others, uh, but that is clearly a place around transportation and traffic management um, now moving to the bigger space of connecting people from a mobility perspective and how you get people around, how do you integrate that with transit and other types of opportunities. I think that's an area that's working. Um, I think one of the areas that is crucial to all of this um, and is sort of working and sort of not is something that, that Tony has touched on, which is this idea of big data and integration associated with it. It's a lot of challenges around integrating data from multiple different sources, from multiple different agencies a lot of times. And there have been good steps made in that, that space, but it's nowhere close to what we wish it to be. And I think that's a huge area of opportunity is in the data, the big data and analytics space that we're moving towards, but still we have too many legacy systems, too much is siloed, um, and a lot of it doesn't talk to each other. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you. So uh, from our perspective, we have seen that cities would like to do a lot, uh, too many changes at the same time, and we kind of uh, try away from that. We've seen that the cities would like to of overhaul their entire operations and that has not worked in terms of inter interdisciplinary or interdepartmental uh, connectivity making sure that this department talk to the other the federal the state you know and also some corridors for implementation of traffic in terms of the city owns the street or the fed this become, belongs to the dot so that kind of interactions has not worked what has really worked is smart connected spaces where you, you take a confined area, solve a problem, use case, uh, connectivity in terms of LMI, low to middle income, connectivity in terms of um, you know ensuring that people in that region are able to uh, get an app or a reporting back to the city with respect to uh, taking a picture of a sidewalk that is broken and sending it up to uh, the city officials. That kind of thing is easier to implement and has worked well. 
Um, I don't want to repeat what David said, but yes, those portions of the um, implementations of video analytics uh, in terms of security LIDAR and uh, implementation of ITMS, intelligent traffic management systems, surely does work. But as it comes to interfacing with multiple departments, federal agencies, and, um, you know, getting all that into one panel and normalizing the data and presenting at something as a big data aspect, it is a challenge. It is not a challenge because we don't know how to do it. There's too many uh, hurdles that we need to cross without dropping every one of them. So, you know, it, it, it is a challenge, but it takes time for implementation. Uh, Tony? Sure. Uh, so think, thanks for having me here and ha happy to sit in. Um, so I'm going to, I'll take some, something that's um, might seem very basic and might seem, you know, nowadays plain, but I think um, Wi-Fi, public Wi-Fi as kind of like a base 1.0 level, level smart city technology um, continues to show its efficacy, its, its, its importance and its value and the pandemic only furthered that, you know, and so you see cities and, and counties and, and government agencies that have um, looked at public Wi-Fi as a, as a tool, as a, as a, you know, one way of addressing this, you know, really vexing social issue of the digital divide and have been really successful with that. And so um, that's something they figured out. They know how to do. They know how to build Wi-Fi networks and support them, and they can expand those into the community and have done it successfully. I think I'm going to echo what my fellow panelists here said about data, and I think that's where it, I've seen it become harder. It's, it's, it's not just presenting the data, collecting the data, storing, presenting it. That's, that's hard enough. But then um, you know, having staff be able to, to use the data and, 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 and analyze the data, you know, that's a whole new skill set. And, and it takes time to develop. You know, we, we've got 150 years of competency in public works. We know how to do that. And, and expanding that to Wi-Fi is, is not a big leap. Um, but now taking on like data analysts and, you know, data scientists, that's a whole new skill. And um, it's going to take some time for cities to build up that competency, I think. Oh, true. Yeah, wow. Well, uh, great, great ideas there. Um, I guess one of the areas that we're most aware of is the pandemic and vaccinations and the challenges that those have caused. Um, you know, I, I heard today that somebody said the U.S. is doing pretty well compared to some other countries. Um, and, but I don't know if that's really comparing to China or to Asia because, you know, we just don't get that much news here. <laughs> um, that's actual news. Um, so I guess I wanted to know what's it, what it has been like where you are and you guys in your towns. Um, I mean, both uh, San Leandro and, and uh, uh, you know, Carlsbad are probably not, they're not huge cities, but maybe you're, you're working in a regional way. Maybe you can talk about that, you, you two guys. Uh, I'll start with David. Sure. Well, it is relevant because actually our fire chief is the regional incident commander and what they decided to do was complement the county's vaccination distribution. So San Diego County had the very first super distribution site um, and actually led the way back on January 11th. They did it at our ballpark at Petco Park and they had this location that for the highest need could be um, dealt with and we're having a decent supply of, of vaccination there. But of course, you want to be able to get it out to some of the really vulnerable populations like long term care facilities, congregate care facilities and other places um, that are more remote and rural. And so what he stood up with all of the other fire departments in the region was called Operation Collaboration, where they had vaccine supply that was specifically focused on those vulnerable populations, those areas that may not be at those super sites initially or at the key county vaccine sites or at hospitals or at your primary care physician. And that's actually worked out incredibly well. The main thing, the, the, the three things I think that have been a challenge are number one, um, appointment and appointment systems. So depending upon who you're going through, uh, you have a different appointment system. You know, I got my first poke at CVS. That was relatively easy. Some of the other county sites uh, from time to time were out of appointments. There was no centralized place. And if you want to talk about the challenges around coordination, you can look no further than exactly this issue where between the federal government, state government, and private sector distributors, there was no centralized ability to have appointments, um, and still it's a bit, bit spotty. 
but the second thing that we were really able to do and what I've seen in the region is as um, vaccines have become available through the private sector, through your Walgreens, your Rite Aid and others, that has been an incredible complement to what the main leads have been. And, you know, if it weren't for the weather that were experienced in the Midwest and in, in Texas, which disrupted actually vaccine supplies pretty significantly, um, I think our region has has been able to do a pretty good job and has um, been able to get, I want to say the most recent numbers were over 18%, I think, fully vaccinated. It might be closer to 20 by this point, 35% with uh, their first um, needle in the arm. So I think San Diego County has done has done relatively well. But a lot of this is complemented by the fact that those private sector, um, uh, call it retail vaccinations, as it were, even though it's free, um, have really brought on significant amount of capacity in addition to what was was happening um, in our region. Hey, Tony. Um, well, I mean, I think a couple of things. I mean, the most obvious is the pandemic has created a sense of urgency that that was not, you have not seen this level of urgency across so many governments at all levels. Um, and that has, you know, went into all, all functions of the government, um, including technology. But, but so that's one thing is that I'll, I'll get to that. But the other one I want to mention, which is building on um, the previous comment, which is, um, we did see really good coordination like the bay area with what they announced in a year ago the first shelter in place i mean it still feels <laughs> surreal to think about it when it happened i know when they announced it we got like a one hour notice ahead the city's got a one hour notice the counties were going to coordinate you know, alameda county santa clara county san francisco county contra costa all coordinated and did this joint announcement that they would all do it and what that showed, though, was that these agencies could work across regionally and enact something really major when, when they needed to. And I think if you look at that in technology and innovation, that's a model, right? It shows that it can be done. There's no reason why governments can't work together um, to achieve regional outcomes. So I think if we look at that as, as the technologists and as the innovators inside of government and say, how can we replicate that before innovation uh, would be something really a worthwhile question to ask. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, and, I, and Sanji, do, do you have any lessons learned from what you've seen? Um, I mean, uh, Bob Bennett, if he were on, would have said, well, uh, he thought that uh, he mentioned that West Virginia did pretty well, with, or is doing pretty well with its rollout of the vaccine. And if you've been to West Virginia, you know that they have lots of other problems and it's a very interesting state. They were getting much better numbers than next door Virginia where I live, um, you know, and still are. Um, and, you know, I think it's partly because of the leadership from the top, but, um, you know, it is about technology primarily because we could, you know, we had a, lots of trouble in Virginia getting, um, you know, getting on the uh, the state run uh, website for a prioritization for a shop. I mean, it's just they had to re relaunch it, I think, twice. Uh, he mentioned also Los Angeles doing pretty well. He mentioned some comp some cities that he didn't think had done a very good job, which I guess will go nameless. <laughs> but have you had any learnings? Now, our um, Qualcomm's involvement in terms of vaccination or the distribution of such has been companies coming to us asking for, how would you do a trackability of end-to-end -end in terms of app, cold chain management? How do you enable that? How do you get technology and um, you know match that to right from pallet level to box level to valve level, ensuring there is proper usage and no wastage, ensuring dock to deck to uh, you know, to administrators' hands, um, traceability of the devices and vaccines. So we have multiple companies like, you know, Cloudleaf, Tag and Track, Mobilogix. They make these devices, you know, that we work with Calamp, and they use the Qualcomm enabled technologies in in the, in the devices. And these devices, and then we have to stitch a complete location as a service platform that we have, which we offer, and this can be then used in terms of delivery of vaccines, monitoring of vaccines, 
ensuring trace trackability and traceability right till the end user. So that aspect is what we've been helping multiple agencies and companies with. As far as um, uh, the robust backend requirements, I think that's a no brainer. We're gonna have to work with ensuring that there is not only access, but the traffic load and being able to make sure that appointments get um, allocated uh, rightly and, and you have the right infrastructure to support that in the back end, that is a that is a no brainer. You you need that. Yeah, I, I guess part of the question is is the next the next pandemic. Um, are we are we any better off today? I guess we are. Well, I think I think there's a lot of learnings. There's a lot of learnings. You know, I think the biggest learning from the cities is they are now thinking towards allocation of funds not only to the broken roads and the traffic and the sidewalks, but also to technology. This this has acted as a catalyst towards adoption of technology and ensuring that cities look at um, uh, uh, technology as, as an investment area that they need to do that. You know, it's not only about hardware infrastructure. It has to be also the intangible technology aspects that need to get deployed for a sustainability over a period of time. So this like it or not, has acted as a catalyst towards adoption of technology in cities which predominantly have not allocated funds in that area. David, am I right, right or wrong? And, yeah, I agree with you, Sanjeet. And what it's really focused on is not just what is on top of the network. Sure, we can talk about IoT and the use of data and all the rest of it, sure. but it really has put a sharp focus both on our municipal information communication technology and our deficiencies there. Um, and then also those for the communities, which is to Tony's point about the importance of, you know, public Wi-Fi and being able to have that level of connectivity. It's also opened up, I think, areas where we clearly know that our existing private sector providers don't provide the level of infrastructure and speeds that are necessary Absolutely. for all the things we want to do. And so it's exposing for both our municipal operations, for our residents, businesses and visitors, um, for consumers that there is significant investment that is necessary and back to the question on does a Biden infrastructure plan um, dedicate resources here it's really an opportunity area for cities because too often we end up thinking about okay we need to layer something on top of you know we need network connectivity for this IOT or for these sensors or for this type of smart city technology but it also comes with the cost of upgrading your entire system to be able to do that or We've built up purpose-built networks specifically for that one system. I mean, 10 years ago, my city built its own wireless network for its for its traffic management system, as opposed to building out a fiber optic network and connecting them and having multiple things on that platform. And I think that's a very sharp point that now the politicians understand and realize and our city managers and leaders realize, oh, we may need to invest millions of dollars in something that doesn't seem like it is drastically improving services and yet setting the, the baseline for us to be able to do that. Um, and I think that's an area that um, we need to continue to press. And uh, to add to David's point, Matt, uh, many cities have come to us asking for private LTE network within the CBRS band. And we are working with the likes of Salona, Fujitsu, Corning to get those up and running with Qualcomm technology enabled private LTE networks, you know, they want to be, they want to control their own destiny. They want to make sure they, they are able to offer the same services. And that's great. I just feel that, you know, it's, it's an area for the cities to kind of get additional revenue. Yeah, I think, you know, I used to cover Congress and, and I guess, um, you know, I, there's going to be some congressmen and senators that don't even understand that the technology could be considered infrastructure. I mean, you know, when they hear that word, it's like, oh, bridge, road, you know, Maybe maybe something related to the sewer system. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. I mean, I think there's a a lot of heavy lifting uh, on an infrastructure bill. Uh, just my little side comment. I guess I'll shift gears though. Um, talk about uh, that tough question that came up in all the keynotes about um, privacy and facial recognition software. Um, do any of you have any a good model for what what should 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 happen? Uh, is it just endless hearings about where where to put a camera, uh, or you know, I, I think uh, Sanjay, you mentioned it. Uh, maybe I'll start with you. Well, I think the you know after after a fifteen hour flight when you come into Los Angeles 
and you see a line of 200 people in normal circumstances, and you go to the global entry box, and you put your fingerprints, and it takes your picture, it does, you don't have to put a fingerprint, and does facial recognition, and you get out of there, that's when you really appreciate technology, and you say, wow, that was great. It, it had my picture, I, I it facial recognized me, and I was out. You know, it all depends how the use cases deploy. You know, you are, your pictures are everywhere in terms of CCTV cameras in the cities and people looking at that. Even when you go to somebody's house, you know, with the ring ring cameras and all the other cameras, it, it, it's out there. It all depends upon how, how you want to use it and, and implement it. There are some companies utilizing it in terms of building access management, VIP alerts, uh, restricted access to factory floors, restricted access to um, data centers. So yes, I mean, that is one way of, you know, access control, granting access, security. It's not only about, you know, following somebody or tracking somebody or, you know, having a big brother approach where somebody just tracking somebody for the sake of traffic. But as I said, it's all use case dependent. It all depends upon how you use that and in what context are you using facial recognition. Oh, either one Sorry, of everyone. Yeah, that's uh, fine. Nice We're good. Well, we had the cat in the last one, so. No, okay. it wasn't a cat. It's my kids. They're they're downstairs, and who knows what they're up to. Um, so. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what about is this when you want facial I mean, recognition in your basement? I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, David, well, see the thing about facial recognition, and so there there's there's questions around policy, right? Okay, if we have a good policy, if we work through you know, the policy considerations and we build trust. What is the what is the policy document ultimately supposed to do? It's supposed to build trust with the community that says, this is what we're going to do with this technology. This is how we're going to use it. And we're going to do what we say we do. You know, we're not going to store the data. We're not going to share the data. We're not going to sell it, et cetera. Um, you're using it as a contract with the community to build trust with them. That's what the key ingredient is when you roll out something like cameras. So you need to have trust. Most most communities don't trust, don't have that trust all the way. So that's why you run into these issues. That's a policy thing. Facial recognition is a technology problem. The reason why facial recognition has problems is because the technology has been shown to be flawed. It, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It, 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 it overwhelmingly misidentifies people of color and women. And when you, you have a technology that overwhelmingly identifies, uh, uh, misidentifies, um, you know, at-risk populations or populations of the community that that it exacerbates existing, you know, social problems. The question becomes: Is it even ethical to deploy it? So that's a more of an ethical question. You know, you have a technology that may be flawed, and and is it? The right thing to do to whether or not you have the right policy isn't a question anymore. So, so facial recognition is 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 even deeper in that it's more of an ethical question, Matt, than it is just a technology or policy question. But but if, if you if you do agree, facial recognition in terms of mass market deployment in a city versus a specific use case deployment is completely two independent paths we're going to like building access or company policy or you know accessing restricted access to uh, people uh, maybe you know, in the federal building that you know and just yeah. like any technology there's, there's a percentage of accuracy no matter what you do right i mean yeah but if you're uh, making if you're making decisions like you can come in here or you can't come in here based on me scanning your face and half the time i get your face wrong and it just happens to be if you're african american that i get it more wrong that seems like it's not that that exacerbates in, in, inequities in our systems, and we should not be. <laughs> we should Honestly, put the brakes on. Absolutely, and you know you you uh, you know coming from a technology company who leads into uh, you know with all this stuff, I can tell you one thing: we've come a long way. The industry has come a long way. The accuracy with the AI companies and the um, and the cameras and implementations has has been ninety seven percent and up. So. It, it will be incorrect um, uh, to say that you know uh, technology is still evolving. Technology always evolves, but the accuracy piece has been improved drastically right now. Yeah, um, in the database. And, and uh, this whole trust question is is. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Matt. 
No, I, I didn't no, know. I mean, this trust question is a global topic. question. And you're, yeah, you're it, it's concerning. The trust question is a global question, and, and it... <laughs> okay, well, that's like we're cross-talking. I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I guess I would just say uh, I've done research and others have on uh, just the data that's used, the quality of the data that's used. And, uh, you know, this is the same issue um, for a car that's going to avoid an accident in you know, an autonomic vehicle. Autonomous vehicle, uh, you know, is the is the dangerous situation inherent in in the uh, in the data set that I've used or not, you know, um, and that's why it takes lots more samples than a lot of data sets have. Kind of back to the data the data topic. Uh, somebody in the audience asked a question. I'm reading it. I may get this wrong. Um, they, they pointed out that in the UK there's a CCTV camera for every 14 people. And um, I think that's that's probably one thing that Americans are not used to. Um, it, it says uh, the question is: Is metro high bandwidth IoT primary the primary use case for CCTV? Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, has anybody done a video uh, deployment? No, the primary well, use case is typically surveillance. I mean, <laughs> the the that's the backhaul. Um, you know, and that therein lies the tension. And I mean, you could find these tensions in any, any, you, we talked a bit about transportation and I'll diverge just a second, but what's the other side of the coin? Pedestrians and bicyclists, you know, when you start to, you know, improve traffic flow for, for cars, the traffic, the, the bicyclists and the pedestrians are going to say, Hey, wait, you're making it more dangerous for us. And so there's, there's just tensions and in, in any decision you make, you, you, you go in this direction and that, then you, you have a tension on this side and, and we can find those in, in any domain we try, which is why smart city technology is so challenging. Um, but no, I think we would probably not have a, a camera every 14 citizens in the U S anytime <laughs> soon. <laughs> I guess not. <yeah. laughs> It'll be a little bit of an overkill, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the reason why I think they happened in London is because of tube, the tube rail, and you know, they they monitor and we have that for incidences that have occurred in, in London, and you know, rightly so. I appreciate and respect what the, what the country is doing, and every use case, as I said, is different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we've got a, a few minutes left. I didn't see a lot of questions. I'm going to check. But um, I do have one that I think would be valuable for um, maybe cities or young engineers. Um, can you each talk about uh, your, the experiences and lessons that you've learned um, that you would want to pass on? Um, because it's very obvious that, as we've talked about, uh, smart city questions are, uh, you know, they're a little bit politics, they're a little bit governance, they're a little bit technology so they're not just technology is my point and mm -hmm. maybe maybe i could ask you all to just talk about lessons learned and, and uh, whoever wants to go first just jump right in i'll go David, no wanna... so... <laughs> go ahead. i was gonna go say ahead. i want to hear david's been through some good stuff with with his experience i'd like to i think i bet he's got a good answer for this go ahead david well, Put you on so the I, the, sure, if my, is it not working? For some reason, my microphone's not working. No, you're good. You're uh, welcome. Let me see if I can. Oh, you guys can hear me. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, two big things. Number one is uh, this has less to do with the technology and everything to do about the people. So challenge definition is absolutely critical in everything that you're doing and getting a shared understanding about what that is. And two, it's part of what Tony is referencing, making sure that as you move forward and deploy, that the expectations at the beginning remain with the community, with the elected officials, with the public, and that you don't get diverted off to other types of use cases that may not have been a part of that shared understanding when the challenge was first started. 
By that, I mean, if I'm being a little bit cryptic, you know, if you d deploy a smart streetlight project, there's tons of things it can do. And you may have some very specific use cases. Once that starts to get proven out, others are going to want to try to use that for other purposes that may not have been a part of what the initial challenge was that was being solved. It may not have been a part of the shared understanding of what that technology could do. And you can think about this with something like, you know, facial recognition or, you know, uh, vehicle infrastructure. You know, you have it for a safety purpose, but then what happens if people start to say, well, we can monetize this data and then you start to sell that data, but that wasn't a part of the shared understanding at the beginning. So as much as you need to adapt your projects as you're moving forward, you really need to make sure that at any critical juncture where the definition of the project changes, where the capabilities of the project change, where other use cases are being entered into it and the public is not a part of that process, where elected officials may not be a part of that process, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. And before you pull the trigger on that expanded use case, that expanded opportunity that seems so good and can literally in this case save lives, just because it can do amazing things doesn't mean you should without making sure that the definition and the goals of the project, if it involves the public, are defined properly. I guess I'll yeah, no, uh, that, Tony, go that ahead. <laughs> no, I was gonna say that that was that was a great answer. Um, and I, I think that's like I think we come up with a new way of looking at smart cities right here. If I would you know put it take away what David said and put it with my own experiences is that it is like a contract with the community and and you can't just go change the terms because, oh, I, I think this would be really cool. Or, you know, and, and technology is dangerous in that way that, you know, five years ago, nobody knew that facial recognition had all these inherent challenges. So if you deployed it then as, a, as an early adopter, you were more likely to be on the bleeding edge and to pay the price for that. And so, you know, that's another reason why our markets move slower is because, you know, a risk here impacts such a wide percentage of people when you're in government service. It's not just, you know, a segment, it's the whole population. And so you want to try your best to, to figure that out ahead of time. And I really like that though, David, to, you know, you, you, it's like a contract. You got to make a contract with your community and then uphold your side of the bargain you know, otherwise they'll have every right to be storming your next public meeting and saying, what do you, what do you mean you're changing the contract? <laughs> um, <laughs> That's not what we agreed to. Yeah. I mean, uh, go ahead, Sanjeet, you're, you're next. Yeah. From a, from a company that, that uh, is on the cutting edge of all the technology all the time, we look at this into two areas, smart cities and smart connected spaces, smart cities, self-explanatory cities come out with RFP. It is literally a public contract. You deploy, we would we would suggest the things that require is a outcome-based deployment. We need a deployment which is outcome-based rather than a just deploying a technology. And when you do an outcome-based uh, uh, deployment, that is for the public. And you gotta go back and work with the cities in terms of monetization. And that contract is between you and the city. How do you help the city to monetize this? Because it's not about profit, it's at least about cost recovery. So if you can get a cost recovery model done with the city, you get an outcome-based deployment done with the population. And at the end of the day, you show them a roadmap that would be able to get you the good, better, best in the technology with an outcome-based rendering. I think that's that's what we as a technology company look for in terms of deployment. Well, uh, I just got an update from and, the and on, that, in, Go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to add to that, and I appreciate that with, from Sanjeet's perspective, because though the companies that are providing solutions and working with cities, um, they may not consistently be thinking about the lens that the cities happen to look through on this. And so having that clear definition as Sanjeet just described, and I agree with either challenge-based or outcomes-based contracts, um, you know, you don't want to be the company that gets stuck in a, a failed public engagement around the deployment. And so being knowledgeable as a company, being involved in these solutions, um, it's important to be asking those same questions because let's be honest, most cities don't have people in them that have the degree of technical and technology experience to be able to fully understand 
everything associated with something a Qualcomm could or would be doing with them, right? You know, uh, generally absolutely. our IT departments are fairly small. Generally, we don't have people that have that. So as a company, if you want to do things right, and I know that's some of the audience here, you also need to be asking those same questions and not just assuming that the person on the other side of the table at the city has fully thought through the implications, the ethical implications, the privacy implications, the engagement implications. And I know Qualcomm, Qualcomm does a great job with that when they engage with folks to really ask those full questions, not what can the technology do, but what is the challenge we're trying to solve? What does the public expect out of this? What do the elected leaders expect? And in doing so, how do we define something in an outcome base that um, is transparent, open, as, as Tony mentioned, but solves the challenge that people are facing. Thank you, David. Uh, further comments? Very good. Um, I just read one of the people here asked or pointed out that there are actually 11 people per CCTV camera in, in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> and and by, by the time we go to um, go to dinner tonight, uh, it will probably be down to 10. So um, per, or t I'm sorry, it'll probably be uh, it'll probably be a different number. Um, yeah, 14 would be. Yeah, we wanted to go. We wanted to go up, I guess. Sorry. Um, depends on your view, I guess. Uh, so I, I just wanted to make sure I, I got a chance to get the big picture here um, is is. Um, I mean, are we going to see more selling of technology, you know, to cities, or is this a is this a cooling off period, or is this a? I mean, maybe that's really a question for Sanjeev, but I, I wonder if you other two could also comment. Well, I think uh, from from Qualcomm's perspective, you know, whether it's cradle point or whether it's cameras or whatever, we are in there. You know, uh, with 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 the chipsets, with the phones, and everything that we do, and you know, we we are we are you know we have a very robust smart city practice that we work with the ecosystem, and we come up together. And IoT is the Internet of te Teamwork. That's what it is, Internet of Teamwork. You got you can't. There's a lot to be done. You can't do it alone. So uh, it's not about selling technology to the cities. As I said, it, it, it's it's deploying technology to solve a use case that the city can offer to the public at the same time, at least recover cost. So that it go back to the elected members and said we didn't lose money here. We are making sure, and this is the outcome-based deployment we are doing. So I would say it's not about selling technology; it is adopting new technologies to solving use cases that can be sustainable over a period of time. That's going to be the challenge going forward, and we are ready for that. Are you guys seeing a leveling off, or are you getting more calls? More calls, more and more calls for private LTE deployments where the cities want to take more uh, control in their hands and kind of take this to the next level. Uh, and from the city side- uh, Yeah, I, I think where you're gonna see a- Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, the shift in the market, the shift in the market is from somebody knocking on your door and saying, we can solve all of your problems from transportation to public safety, to schools, to education. Uh, it's going to cost you half a billion dollars to do that. And we'll do all these solutions. You don't really have to do a whole lot. Just let us get in there and do the work and we'll monetize the data to pay for half of it. I'm being somewhat facetious, but I think all of us have actually heard pitches that get pretty close to that. Like we'll solve the entire city's problems if you just give us access to X, Y, and Z and you're, it's not gonna cost you much of anything. The intersection between what the city actually needs and has the capacity to deploy and what the opportunities around technology are to deploy is where the big gap has been here, which is why so many companies have been frustrated with that translation between what they can do and what the city actually wants. And so you'll spend years getting calls from the same people who are given the same pitch, but there's never that intersection between, okay, here are my top five challenges. Here's how we're gonna define what a solution is. And here's whether or not that the insights around the value connected to that for the city, for the citizens. And, and so what I'm seeing is less of the, we can solve everything and more of a definition and a focus on key areas that are the most critical from a community, political and operational standpoint, and then focusing energy effort and capacity in solving those things. And you've heard what a number of those are. One of them is definitely um, inf information communications technology. Another is uh, the, the questions around 
how we are addressing, you know, the fundamental things that always annoy people like traffic, mobility, um, public safety in some cases and the like. Yeah. Tony, I'd like to give you the last word. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, um, I think, like I said in the keynote, you'll see winners just just like David said, you're going to see winners in certain areas. Pu you know, public safety is going to still be interested in technology applied to, you know, crime in the community, cameras and audio detectors, gunshot detection, etc. Um, because there's something there, you know, they see a value there. Uh, the tension is still going to be there with the community in the way that it's deployed, but that's not going to prevent those use cases from going forward because there is a value there. Um, so the best, the winners are going to be the ones that, you know, think of it just like smartphones, right? Apple, Apple was so successful because it removed a lot of the technology and the com complexity of all the technology and it just made it simple, you know, and, and the, it's the same in smart cities, the, the vendors and the solutions that are ultimately really successful are the ones that solve a use case really well. Uh, and tell an easy to understand story that can be understand by non-technical people and they see the value of it and they're going to pursue it. And that's going to, and you'll see those winners emerge in every domain. And I agree though, it's not going to be like this master system. You're never going to have that. Um, but you will have winners in transportation, public safety, um, libraries, recreation, schools, who address certain issues and take away the techno technological complexity and make a very really simple system that is not, they don't have to, you know, worry about all, all of the bits and bytes. It just does what it's supposed to do. Yeah. You know, I think it's kind of funny you say, Tony, thanks for re reiterating our vision statement of Qualcomm, but we take the complexity <laughs> out of the equation and we bring that. So. Thank you very much. That's a great way to end. That's a great way to end. That's what this is practicing. They're probably, yep. they're probably uh, killing so each other now. Yeah, Sanji's going to be calling you right after this. So. <laughs> All right. Very good, gentlemen. Uh, this is great. Thank you. You know, I, I figured out why they call it smart cities because the smart people are doing it. That's my my definition. So thank you smart very much. To use it. Thank you. Thank you so thank much, you. guys. Great meeting everybody. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate everything, Matt. Good to see you guys. Thank you. Take care. Hey, thank you, Matt and panelists. And uh, I really agree with Matt. I am really grateful that it's smart, passionate people like you who are thinking about this and debating it and helping cities to figure it out and move it forward. I really want to thank you for your efforts. And I want to thank our attendees for um, participating in the IoT Technology Summit. Special thanks to this afternoon's sponsor, CradlePoint. I'd also like to thank all of our speakers today and throughout the event and to our attendees for such great questions. Best of luck to you and your design work. And please mark your calendar the dates for our next digital event, the Fierce MedTech Innovation Week, April 26th to 28th, with a powerful lineup of speakers, including Medtronic, Aura, Kinza, and Blumio. Thank you. <laughs>